Okay, so the first uh, part of the primary topic is a uh, de novo design of proteins through Foldit. Uh, de novo design, uh, so the little title is de novo design at a glance. Um, so since 1971, the Protein Data Bank has been the world's library for three structures of, and I'm going to change this to biological molecules, um, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, but what if, uh, but what if we want new proteins that can solve 21st century problems like breaking down plastic, and then there's PDBIDs, uh, or building drug molecules more efficiently, another PDBID. Building custom proteins called de novo design, which is Latin for uh, from the new, uh, is notoriously difficult because a protein can adopt thousands of shapes in, 3D, in a 3D space. With over 170,000 experimentally determined structures, the PDB can help us understand the rules dictating how spaghetti-like amino acid chains assemble into building blocks of life. The building blocks of life. Uh, scientists implement these rules as complex algorithms in protein building programs. Uh, one program is AlphaFold, developed by Google's DeepMind, which won the 14th bi biennial a critical assessment of protein structure prediction experiment. Another program is Rosetta, a linchpin in the protein prediction world since 1999. Uh, however, the programs are not perfect. Sometimes a structure is predicted that is possible in theory, but is not the most stable, i.e. Uh, having the... What should count? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> i.e. having the lowest energy or the most favorable energy. Uh, additionally, trying to combine uh, bleh, trying all combinations of 3D orientations can take computers weeks or months. The process needed to be streamlined so programs would focus on shapes that are feasible while still trying as many uh, different folds as possible. So the second, um, second, uh, second section of the uh, primary topic is a uh, solution folded. Folded is an interactive game that enables players to collaboratively design protein structures. It follows the rules set by Rosetta to make protein structures through stabilizing interactions such as hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and hydrophilic interactions, etc. Et it has an easy to use interface, so players can manu manipulate structures manually based on their spatial intuition rather, rather than using programs. These simplifications make folded user friendly for people with varying experiences. The game also lets players use their 3D problem solving skills to explore a unique range of structures than computers. To start a challenge, Scientists can upload the puzzles where a protein's amino acid sequence is provided as a reference. The difficulty level of puzzles varies from modifications of an already folded structure to protein structure prediction problems to the novel design of an entire protein, which is the hardest. Then, folded users make 3D structures aiming to have the highest points in the game. Afterwards, users could see their hallucinated structures turn into real proteins confirmed by scientists in lab experiments. Amazingly, most users have little experience in protein design and they collaborate on creating and folding several new proteins. Uh, so the impact of de novo design. Recent efforts in different approaches to designing new proteins have led to a great deal of progress for de novo design, especially in the creation of new 3D protein shapes. Although proteins have varying amino acid sequences, the shapes in which they fold into, called folds, are often very similar. Discovering new protein folds has been a cornerstone of de novo design, as new folds can be used as templates to create a variety of enzymes from. With the help of scientists, folded users were able to create a total of 20 unique protein structures entirely from scratch, one of which was a newly discovered protein structure. Other scientific groups have used algorithms like Rosetta to design new protein folds from scratch as well, such as TOP7, uh, which is actually, there was a molecule the month before this in like 2005, I think David did. Uh, these new folds are the basis from which new enzyme-based solutions are created, such as proteins that help fight off viral infections or the creation of molecules that can track specific chemicals in cells. 
Thanks to new computational design tools, there are now more possibilities for de novo design proteins than ever before. Okay, uh, for the secondary topic, other successes of protein building. Uh, de novo protein design may be the end goal, but there have been many uh, remarkable accomplishments for structure prediction and optimization. Breaking down PET type one plastic, uh, for example, is extremely difficult. Scientists made an efficient PET hydrolase, uh, PDBIDs, um, through structure optimization. Uh, uh, when scientists want a drug molecule that targets a virus, for example, they first need a structure for uh, a structure of their target, uh, the target for the Mason Pfizer uh, monkey virus <clears throat> that causes AIDS in monkeys. Uh, was its proteus enzyme, which cuts immature proteins into functional units for the virus to propagate. Uh, after 10 years, scientists were still unable to match the fold of the protease to its 3D form revealed from experiments. Folder player, the <laughs> folded players correctly shaped the protease with the PDBID, uh, and it was ready for drug development. The folded players were also able to improve an existing enzyme by increasing its catalytic activity by more than tenfold. The players were guided by scientists to build a lid for the enzyme uh, that held the substrate more tightly for a more efficient reaction. Uh, I guess, yeah, I'll read this part too. For proteins to adopt their stable 3D structure, uh, many different types of interactions occur between individual amino acids. Hydrophilic amino acids uh, that are in the picture blue for charged, light blue for non-charged polar amino acids, uh, interact with water molecules outside the protein, making the protein soluble in the cytoplasm. Hydrophobic amino residues, <sighs> amino acids <laughs> uh, in yellow, uh, point towards each other to avoid the water molecules, forming a closed area called the hydrophobic core. Uh, in a close-up of the positively charred, positively uh, dark blue, and negatively uh, in red charged atoms, uh, one positively charged arginine interacts with four negative glutamates to form the ionic interaction. In this in this close-up right here, uh, an electron-rich, i.e., negative charge, can also be uh, created. Uh, by a ring of carbons and form a pi cation interaction as shown between the phenylalanine and arginine here. And then we have our topics for exploration. Oh, and our script. Um, uh, could we look at the tagline? Oh, Can yeah. Should I, should I read out? Yeah, the, sure. Uh, the keywords would be folded, citizen oh, science. You don't need the keywords, but the, the teaser. The teaser, yes. Yeah. So what if people with no formal experience in science could help improve or even rewrite nature simply by playing a game? Nice. That's really, really nice, evocative. Uh, why don't we take a closer look at the, the first two figures as well? Beautiful. So these were made in Pymol, the first ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, or, or Chimera, Pymol. Perfect. Look at that electric green. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, uh, do we have comments from the group? Uh, I, I can say two things quickly. The, the word hallucinated. Wow. <laughs> That's great fun. And uh, just for everybody, for instance, you mentioned top seven in here as being in a previous article. And so we'll put links in these articles that'll link back to, uh, to previous ones. So uh, that'll give uh, people the ability to go and, and get background information on stuff that you don't cover in detail. 
Great. And, and David, there are also links to the PDB structure summary pages. Right. As so well. all of the PDB IDs will have links into the main archive so people can go right away and start looking at them. Mm -hmm. right. So do we have other comments from people? Well, if no one else is going to say something, I will concur with David. And I think that the, uh, the citizen science team did a very good job. Congratulations and congratulations to Shuchi for, uh, for mentoring the team. Uh, this was a difficult topic. And uh, I think it's been presented in a way that's quite lucid and accessible. The illustrations are great. Uh, I think I will take exception with the word hallucinated and perhaps say imagined. But uh, other than that, very gentle criticism. I think it was really very nicely done. Yeah, it, to me, it got a nice tone as well of, of explaining Fold It without being a, a real commercial for Fold It. So th that, that was a tricky thing for you to balance in this team. So I think you did it well. Shuchi, you had comments? No, I apologize. I was uh, writing comments and feedback right at the very end, and that showed up. So sorry for that. That's OK. This but, is um, yeah, I, I think um, between yesterday and today, this article uh, transformed immensely. So great job. Yeah, Thank that, you. That, uh, the, the two teams I've been working with, it was the same thing. Just the, the editing phase this morning, it, it turned into something wonderful. So I applaud everyone. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, let's move on uh, and look at the Glucodex team. Glucodex. So for our primary topic, um, the first title was Fight Against COVID-19. Uh, glucocorticoid drugs have been widely prescribed for the treatment of inflammatory and autoimmune diseases and have recently been repurposed to treat critically ill COVID-19 patients. COVID-19 progressive, progressive swi progresses swiftly from symptoms like fever and shortness of breath to severe complications like multiple organ failure. Critically ill patients experience a cytokine storm where the body is no longer able to limit the inflammatory response to the coronavirus, and the, and the apparent production of cytokines triggers further complications in the human body. Clinical trial data has shown that the administration of low-dose de dexamethasone, a potent anti-inflammatory drug that binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, has been effective in reducing mortality rates in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Uh, so the second paragraph was the receptor on the move. So along with the estrogen receptor, GR belongs to the nuclear receptor family. It consists of three domains or parts, a ligand binding domain, a DNA binding domain, and a transactivation domain. The most abundant ligand or small molecule for this receptor in humans is cortisol, a stress hormone. When GR binds to cortisol, the receptor changes its conformation and migrates from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. In the nucleus, it can bind to target DNA sequences to influence gene expression or transcription. GR can also interact with coactivators to help it regulate the gene expression machinery. The LBD-bound dexamethasone from PDB entry 1M2Z is shown on top, while the D DBD bound to the DNA from PDB entry 1GLU is shown on the bottom. These two domains are connected via a flexible linker. The large transactivation domain can also interact with the gene expression machinery, but it is not shown here. All the domains of GR work together to relay the initial message triggered by the binding of the ligand. Too much inflammation. The structure of synthetic dexamethasone is very similar to that of natural cortisol. This allows dexamethasone to bind snugly within the glucocorticoid receptor and trigger changes in gene expression that work to resolve inflammation in the body. This activity makes dexamethasone particularly effective in treating COVID-19, as the damage caused by the coronavirus is not only due to the virus itself, but also from uncontrolled inflammation. However, the anti-inflammatory effects of dexamethasone 
can be harmful if the drug is administered in the wrong context or at the wrong time. In the early stages of COVID-19, the body must be able, must be capable of mobilizing its immune system to fight off the virus. And treatment of early non-severe COVID-19 with dexamethasone may inadvertently lead to a worse outcome for the patient. And we can read the favorite caption. So glucocorticoid receptor in green with ligand binding domain top and DNA binding domain bottom, co-activators in salmon and DNA in purple. The flexible linker of the protein is not included in the structures and is represented schematically with dots. Dexamethasone shown in a magnified view is hidden within the glucocorticoid receptor and is compared with cortisol. Ligand atoms are colored with carbon in gray, oxygen in red and fluorine in green. Okay, and our secondary topic is titled uh, dex dosing. It's, it's complicated. Uh, like many other drugs and hormones, dexamethasone is primarily transported throughout the body by binding to serum albumin or SA, which, con which constitutes 55% of the proteins found in the blood plasma. However, factors related to this protein can complicate the safe and effective administration of dexamethasone when treating COVID-19 associated inflammation. In diabetic patients, for example, an amino acid and SA critical for dexamethasone binding is frequently bonded to a sugar molecule through a process known as glycation, which can prevent the drug from attaching to the protein. Dexamethasone and certain other drugs taken at the same time, including common pain relievers like ibuprofen, can also compete for the same binding site on SA, hindering dexamethasone transport. Additionally, COVID-19 risk factors such as liver disease, malnutrition, or advanced age can lower a patient's SA levels. There is evidence to show that the virus itself can similarly affect levels of SA in the body. These complications make it hard for physicians to estimate the relative levels of free and bound dexamethasone in the blood and can potentially lead to increased drug toxicity, side effects, and or loss of drug efficacy. And then below, we have the figure for this section, uh, which with the caption, uh, Equin serum albumin with bound dexamethasone in blue in the ID, uh, Equin in human, and then I give the PDB ID I used to get the RMSD uh, of, for human serum albumin. Uh, Equin and human serum albumins are highly similar with a sequence identity of 76.1% and a uh, root mean square deviation of 1.65 angstroms. And then in exploring the structure, we have two ligands, one receptor. Uh, these images compare the glucocorticoid receptor bound to dexamethasone left and cortisol right. Both these ligands are very similar in structure and bind snugly in the same pocket in the glucocorticoid receptor. The ligands are shown in space filling atomic coloring with the glucocorticoid receptor shown in the green ribbon model. This illustration was created using JMOL. To explore these images further, click on the interactive JMOL tab. And then in that interactive tab, um, we can say use the buttons to switch between the glucocorticoid receptor bound to either dexamethasone or cortisol. Can you spot the two differences between the two ligands? And then the two buttons and then the scripts. Oh, and then yeah, topics for exploration. Super, super, super. Uh, can we go back up to the very top? So I, I think your team really came up with a great first paragraph for this, uh, which is a tricky subject, right? You don't want to talk about people dying right away and stuff like that. And so the, the first sentence of this is uh, talking about the hope, you know, that that we have these drugs that we can use. And then it talks about the scary stuff. And then it uh, can we go down and look at that again? Because I remember the last, the last sentence brings it right back to the hope and Could the. Could you promise. make this a little bigger for the uh, the slightly elderly members of the audience? Um, if you do a slide, if you use your slider on the bottom of the uh, MS Word, bottom right of the MS Word uh, window. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So I, I, thank I think you. This is a really effective first paragraph for this uh, for this talk. Really nice. Uh, and I also like the the last sentence of this second paragraph. Um, uh, this is a very complicated paragraph. 
with a lot of details. And that last sentence kind of puts it all in perspective. So I, I thought that was nicely, nicely done. And then I really like the, the last little sentence of, in your, uh, uh, in your j -mal, uh, about looking for, can you see the differences between uh, the two, the, the cortisol and the dexamethasone? That, that's a really nice little touch. Just, just the kind of thing we want to do to get people looking at these things critically. So beautiful. Uh, other comments, Stephen, do you have comments about the, the team? I, I think the team's done a great job. I, um, I, I won't pat myself on the back because um, I didn't do an enormous amount of mentoring. The team was uh, self-starting and um, just did a terrific job. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud of you and uh, I'm very impressed. I thought this was a great uh, article and I could see uh, Stephen's direction in the figure legends. From personal experience, I could see that very clearly. <laughs> yeah, you may be giving me too much credit, Shushi. Oh, interesting. We all edit each other. It's no, no, the, but there are always things to learn, and yeah. and they did a great job learning because it's yeah. very clear and very very, yeah. Yeah, very nicely presented. Yeah, this is going to be a, a really nice um, addition to the um, growing set of COVID materials that we oh, have. The on collection, yeah. So that's that's very useful. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, nicely done. We'll send a copy to President Trump. Um, he actually, in with with the benefit of, benefit of hindsight, <clears throat> I think you could argue that he actually should not have received uh, dexamethasone because oh. he wasn't sick enough. How interesting. Yeah, but they threw the kitchen sink at him. Well, you kind of have to with yeah. the guy. And he room. and he was very lucky. He uh, he got away with, uh, you know, with minimal time in hospital on supplemental oxygen. You could see when he got back to the White House that he was gasping for breath when he walked up the steps. Oh yeah. So he clearly was still having. There was still a lot of infiltrate in his lungs. And he couldn't speak without uh, full sentences without gasping. Yep, awful disease. That yeah. is for sure. Okay, um, uh, let's move on to the platinum power team. Okay, uh, just share my uh, screen. Yeah, it's the right screen. Okay, Let me share the teams. All right. And can you make um, this a little bit wider? Uh, can ah, you make this bigger, sure. please? Sorry. Yes. And maybe click it one more time. Maybe mm -hmm. one more time. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Great. Excellent. OK. Um, so we are Platinum Power. <laughs> um, so this is just an author affiliations metadata. Um, and the article starts here. So. Um, Sai, you were going to do the first part, right? So, or uh, so one drug is platinum. So imagine a drug that increased cure rates for a disease by fifty-five percent. Cisplatin, a compound of platinum bound by two amine and two chlorides, was a game changer in treating testicular cancers, increasing cure rates from five percent to sixty percent. Cisplatin produces DNA crosslinks by binding adjacent guanine bases on the same strand. These crosslinks bend or kink the DNA, hamper its normal function, and damage the cell and its genome. Besides testicular cancer, cisplatin is also one of the earliest FDA-approved drugs to treat ovarian cancers and tumors of connective tissues, head and neck. So then we slowly get into the action of cisplatin. So the title is Cisplatin in Action. Cisplatin affects the cell by changing the conformation of the DNA. Mostly proteins of the high mobility group DNA binding family, aka HMG domain proteins, successfully compete with the other proteins to bind to the cisplatin bound DNA. This shields the DNA from other proteins involved in DNA replication, repair, and transcription. Furthermore, cisplatin damaged DNA acts as a protein sinkhole, diverting proteins from their original purposes. 
these events collectively impedes cellular processes and trigger apoptosis or programmed cell death. And then we slowly get into how cells resist uh, cisplatin uh, treatment. While cisplatin is very effective in treating several human cancers, it causes damage to the kidneys, liver, and heart. Also, tumors can develop resistance to cisplatin treatment by several ways, and we've included a couple of mechanisms there, uh, including resist reducing cisplatin intake and downregulating mechanisms that cause cell death. Structural studies have been pivotal in developing drugs that overcome resistance with even greater potency and reduced toxicity. A chemical cousin to cisplatin, oxaliplatin, has proven to be effective in treating tumors that have acquired cisplatin resistance because it can more easily enter the cells and is harder to remove from DNA than cisplatin. And these are our key figures depicting the whole mechanism. So we have a standard conformation DNA and then there is cisplatin coming and binding to the minor groove there so that you could see the bend in the DNA. And this bent cisplatin DNA complex is now conveniently uh, uh, pulling HMG towards itself and forms a complex of HMG, DNA, and cisplatin. And these are the four references that we have basically uh, uh, used to come up with the primary topic. Um, disrupting proteins. Cisplatin-bound DNA impairs the normal functions of proteins involved in DNA repair and transcription. The nucleotide excision repair, NER process, typically removes bulky abnormalities called lesions caused by chemicals or radiation by cutting out the damaged region of DNA. Normally, NER can remove cisplatin-bound DNA, but when cisplatin is bound, the bent structure facilitates HMG proteins to bind to the helix and blocks NER proteins from removing the error. The NER protein XPA binds to the kinked DNA from both sides of the damaged helix. Then XPA inserts a loop into each strand of the DNA, separating the DNA into single strands in those regions. This allows other NER proteins to bind and remove the entire lesion. However, the entire mechanism is blocked when HMG proteins bind to the cisplatin DNA complex, allowing the damage to persist. So here we have a figure showing the XPA proteins binding to each side of the damaged DNA helix. The cisplatin-bound DNA also prevents RNA polymerase II from transcribing the cell's DNA to RNA. When cisplatin is bound to DNA, the bulky lesion gets stuck in the enzyme and cannot move to the active site where transcription occurs. So we show here how RNA polymerase II stalls transcription at the cisplatin-bound DNA. Here we explore cisplatin resistance, um, and this section is titled polymerases, friend or foe. Eukaryotes use specialized DNA polymerases to bypass lesions like cisplatin and other damage damages, such as cross-links formed by UV radiation. However, cancer cells can hijack these me mechanisms to gain resistance to cisplatin. One example is DNA polymerase, polymerase eta, a repair polymerase that normally helps cells to survive exposure to UV radiation. Cancer cells use this enzyme to replicate their DNA across the cross-linked lesion, and DNA polymerase kappa also bypasses the cisplatin DNA lesion. So we show DNA polymerase eta on the left here and DNA polymerase kappa on the right. Cancer cells use these DNA polymerases to replicate DNA past the lesion. Should be good now? All right. Um, and now let me just, so this is my, um, uh, this is my description for the JMOL, which I'll show after this. So in the JMOL, I try to show that um, once the cisplatin shown in red binds the DNA, uh, it produces a large bend that makes the DNA uh, impossible to read. Uh, cisplatin produces this link of the DNA by pulling the guanine bases towards its central platinum atom. This then allows for some other proteins, mostly from the high mobility group, HMG in blue, to bind to the DNA. Oops, should be a punctuation here. <laughs> Uh, this prevents both DNA repair and further hampers the cell's ability to transcribe and replicate the DNA. Uh, PDB entry 1CKT includes a short strand of DNA, a cisplatin lesion, and the DNA binding domains of an HMG1 protein. 
Uh, notice how the HMG intercalates the phenylalanine cyan, <laughs> phenylalanine uh, in cyan into the helix, which is a critical step in the binding of an HMG protein into a lesion DNA helix. Uh, so I'll just stop here for a minute and show uh, the JMOL. There we go. Um, all right. Um, oops. Zoom out a bit. Zoom in, zoom out. Okay. Uh, so here is the JMOL. Um, as you can see, there's the uh, DNA helix with the uh, differently colored bases. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to show was that it was really pulling on these uh, guanine atoms. Uh, since in the illustration, it's kind of hard to see the specifically where it's pulling and how it might really twist the DNA. Um, so I really wanted to make sure that I could show it off. So I made the bases wireframe um, and kind of made them a different color from the DNA. Um, and yeah, over here, you see the phenylalanine residue, um, which is really, really important. I think without it, um, the HMG protein, uh, even though it combined at many other points in the DNA that I couldn't show. Um, it just will not bind at all without the uh, phenylalanine. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just zoom out a bit. Again, try and show the kink in the DNA. Yeah, and uh, that's the JMOL. Cool. That is definitely bent, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Uh, do we have comments about this? I'll pull up the uh, article again. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was a really good idea uh, for, for this team, for you, uh, the way you split the secondary topic into two separate topics. I think that worked really well. Uh, repair. Um, uh, yeah. Repair and the the uh, bypass polymerases. That was a really smart thing to do. Uh, to break that topic into two. Mm. Yeah. And there was something. Can we go to the very top? Yep. I wanted to mention about up to the first paragraph or two. Ah. Yeah, so this, this pro progression from start, starting with cancer and then drilling down into uh, the details of the, the structure is, is a really nice uh, formula for, for telling these kind of stories. So I, I thought that worked really well. Uh, and of course, this word uh, sinkhole is wonderful. People have been mentioning really nice visual, uh, visual language. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Should you or Stephen, do you have things, comments? So could we um, just kind of look, look back at your JMOL for a second, please? Sure. I think you guys, guys did a spectacular job on this. Very good. Thank you, thank you. And I, I wanted to, um, um, can you just zoom in now on the phenylalanine uh, in the uh, uh, yeah. intercalating into the base. Oops, sorry, center. So there's, um, there's some other structures in the PDB that I did from um, back in the early 1990s. This structure was done in the late 1990s um, that showed a case where there was a pair of phenylalanine sticking in from the minor groove face, bending the DNA like this. 
In fact, there are two pairs of phenylalanines inducing two different kinks in the, in the DNA separated by five or six bases. Oh. And uh, so this had been seen before um, in, uh, in the context of, uh, of this entity known as the Tata box binding protein that's responsible for binding to the TATA uh, element found in um, uh, RNA polymerase to uh, promoter DNA just upstream of the transcription start site. So this is another beautiful example of just how plastic DNA is. Uh, there's a, also a, a, another structure which will uh, resonate with David that um, would be worth looking at. And I bet there's a molecule of the month on it. This is right-handed DNA, the B form DNA, and even this distorted DNA is right-handed. Uh, but there's also a left-handed DNA and a structure of that was done um, probably at the time that uh, David was a PhD student. Uh, yep. and, that, and that structure is further evidence of just how plastic and how deformable DNA is, even more deformable than, uh, than proteins, arguably. Very, oh. very nice uh, uh, example here of, of this phenomenon induced not by a protein, but induced by the drug. And then the protein takes advantage of it. And I think Samuel, you're correct. I think if you made a mutant of this um, HMG protein in which you changed that uh, phenylalanine into an alanine, so remove the six membered ring, I don't think it would bind uh, like this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was really wild. Beautiful job. Sure. Yeah, beautiful job. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we uh, let's move on and uh, look at the retrovirus. Did, did, Ch did Chuchi have any comments? Um, I do actually. Yeah, um, please. Yeah. I, I had one small suggestion. Since this platinum has been painted to be this wonder drug, it's doing all these amazing things. I was curious to be able to see that molecule by itself. So like in the glucocorticoid uh, receptor, right beside the the bound structure, they showed the molecule, just the cisplatin platin by itself. I was wondering if that could be added to um, sort of showcase how this small little molecule can do so many big things. So how about from the whole team? Does that sound like a good idea? It does. Yeah. Uh, just Because it's uh, in most of the structures, it's kind of buried. It's sort of inside or yeah. covered. Mm. So yeah. just, just down, since we're at the end of, of our workshop here, down in your figure caption, just write, hey, Dave, <laughs> put in a picture of, of, uh, of cisplatin. Because I can just do that in JMOL really, really quick. All right. Uh, I'll just stick a comment in here. Because the article was so nicely written, I kept reading it, and I kept thinking, I want to see this molecule now. Yeah. <laughs> so There's actually a whole secondary uh, structural story that was all the rage when I was in grad school, which is that cisplatin is a platinum with four, four ligands around it, two mm -hmm. chlorines and two uh, aminos, and the chlorines get replaced by water, and then they attach to the base edges. But there's also one called transplatin ah. that have the two uh, chlorines on opposite sides of the square, you know, diagonal. Mm -hmm. And that one doesn't form cross links and is not effective as a cancer agent. Ah. So when I back when I was in, in grad school, they were first solving these structures and figuring those details out. I don't think it's really salient to tell that story here. No. But for structural biologists, it's very interesting and the basis of entire careers. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yep. Actually, the grad student in my lab before before me did did one of the cisplat structures, so which turned out awesome. to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Details. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the the Rutgers RNA group. But before before we do, would um, since oxaliplatin is mentioned, mm -hmm. would it be relevant to include a um, a, diag a drawing of the chemical structure of oxaliplatin? Alongside cisplatin, yeah, oh. that could go in as well. Yeah. All right, stick another comment. Let's try it out. Yeah. You'll see it's quite a bit more complicated, but um, 
it, you know, it, it works via a very similar concept. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. I'll share. Okay, whenever you're ready. And can you make it a little bigger again? Um, yeah. Those with yeah. old, old eyes. Old uh, eyes. <laughs> okay. right, perfect, thank you very much. <laughs> Are you going to go, Diane? Or? Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead take it up. Sorry, I'm just like pulling it up. I'm really sorry. No, it's okay. Perfect. So, um, prior to the discovery of ribozymes, proteins were believed to be the only biological molecule that could perform enzyma enzymatic reactions. In 1982, researchers were surprised to learn that RNA molecules exhibit catalytic activity proving that nucleic acids are more than simple carriers of genetic information. Ribonuclease P, or RNAs P, is an example of a ribozyme that performs a key role in the biosynthesis of proteins. It cleaves pre-tRNA generating tRNA molecules with a mature five prime end that are ready to be utilized in translation. Okay, so our next subheading is tRNA cleaver. Transfer RNA or tRNA facilitates protein synthesis by matching three-letter codons of nucleic acids to their corresponding amino acids. As this process is paramount, is paramount for cell survival, tRNA molecules are highly regulated and undergo extensive structural modifications <clears throat> after they transcribed as free tRNA. Shown here in PDB entry, the endonuclease RNAs P cuts five prime precursor RNA from pre from pre tRNA, producing a mature tRNA molecule ready to do its job. Human nuclear RNAs P is comprised of a 10 subunit protein and a large catalytic RNA strand. The individual protein components serve to stabilize and orient the RNA in such a way that it allows for tRNA recognition and subsequent catalysis. And here's a beautiful picture of our uh, RNAs P bound with tRNA. So this is human nuclear RNAs P in complex with tRNA. Uh, the catalytic RNA is in red, the protein subunits in blue, and the bound tRNA in yellow. Do you want me to do this one too? Or? Oh, I'm doing it right now. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. I'm muting myself. Yep. So, um, location, location, location. Human cells have two types of pre-tRNA cleavers. A ribozyme RNase P that contains a catalytic RNA strand. And Can a I sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I think you're reading the wrong uh, document. Ooh. Okay. I'll go ahead and read it, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so, that, that was our unrevised version, yes. So, uh, RNase P diversity. While both bacteria and archaea have just one type of RNase P, some eukaryotes have two kinds of pre-TNR cleavers. A ribozyme RNase-P that contains a catalytic RNA strand and a form that lacks RNA altogether, protein-only RNase-P. Although both endonucleases perform the same function, they differ in both cellular location and structure. So props work in the mitochondria, cutting pre-TRNA involved in the expression of genes crucial for energy production that are encoded by a separate mitochondrial genome. The RNA-based RNAP, on the other hand, modifies pre-tRNA in the nucleus. Protein subunits of props and RNA-based RNAs-Ps have analogous function, but share no structural homology. Okay, so our next section is titled Molecular Fossil. RNAs-P is one of two ribozymes present in nearly all organisms, with the other being the ribosome. It is believed that a form of RNAs-P was present before the diversification of the three domains of life. In fact, RNAs P is hypothesized to be a remnant of an ancient RNA based world. Differences in bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryotic nuclear RNAs Ps arise in protein content, as generally those present in higher level organisms contain a greater number of protein subunits. As shown in PDB entry 3Q1Q, top left, bacterial RNAs P holds a small protein subunit that accounts for only 10% of the ribozyme's total mass. 
also shown is PDB entry 6K0B top right and our kale RNAs P that functions as a dimer with eight total protein subunits in PDB entry 6AHU bottom, a human nuclear RNAs P composed of 10 protein subunits. In all organisms, the catalytic RNA strand has a, has a conserved sequence and structure. And in this figure, we compare all three structures, the bacterial, our kale, and human nuclear RNAs P with bound tRNA. The RNA subunits are shown in red, protein subunits shown in blue, and tRNA shown in yellow. So ribonucleus P in action. Um, so uracil 80, U80 is a conserved nucleotide of the human RNAs P found in the ribosomes catalytic center. A close study of the nucleotide in the active side of the RNAs P reveal a conformational change in the U80 upon binding tRNA. And a superposition of RNA-SP with and without the tRNA bound shows uh, show bulging of U80 in the absence of tRNA, which is colored in cyan, and creating a aesthetic hindrance that renders catalysis inactive. Although um, no global structural change is observed, U80 undergoes a local conformational change, which is highlighted in light blue when bound to tRNA or turning catalysis on. Protein subunits are hidden for clarity, and you can use the buttons to toggle between views of RNA-SP with and without tRNA and superimposed. So if you, um, at the bottom is the pictures of um, tRNA um, with and without, um, is the pictures of RNA-SP with and without tRNA with zoom in regions of the U80, which is found to be in the catalytic center uh, of the ribozymes catalysis. And yeah, and uh, if you scroll to the bottom, you would see um, the full picture of tRNA, uh, RNA-sp with the protein tRNA and RNA. So, to so oh, topics. Go okay, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, no, video. no, no go, go ahead, go ahead. Don't worry. Okay. Um. Well, should we read our topics for further discussion or? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Help them there. Sure. So, uh, first, structures for many uh, types of endoribonucleases are available in the PDB archive. To learn about additional examples, try searching and then some PDB IDs. Uh, be sure to visit the EM data resource to explore the cryo EM data supporting the structures of RNASP, for instance, and then take a look at a PDB ID. And then also, those uh, mitochondrial RNASPs we mentioned earlier. Uh, props are unique types of RNAs-Ps in that they can they lack a catalytic RNA subunit. Explore the three-dimensional structure of a prop by looking and then another PDB ID. Perfect. That number three in particular is the kind of thing I always like to find. You yeah. know, <laughs> off you go, explore something new. Now that you're hooked. <laughs> yeah. Well, so much good stuff. That these these structures are amazing, aren't they? And yeah, so in that uh, in that JMOL, I guess we're going to be mm -hmm. switching between those two with and without structures. Yeah. And also giving people yeah. the ability to look at the whole thing and also close up on the um, uh, on the active site. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be real easy to do. Well, we'll be able to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I really like the sentence uh, in the evolution part: the remnant of an ancient. RNA world, whatever that one was. Uh, remnant of an ancient RNA based world, really nice visual, nice. Uh, and uh, a, a good introduction as well, getting getting people into it. Uh, in these kind of basic science ones, it's since there isn't really a direct health uh, story that we're talking about, it's sometimes difficult to come up with a, a hook that works. But um, yeah, I think we, we really struggled with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this worked really well, talking about the, uh, the, the uniqueness of ribozymes as being the thing to get people interested. I thought that, that worked really well. Um, other comments? I think this was also excellent. Uh, I didn't actually know very much about this topic. I feel much, much more comfortable with it now. And I think the three images, if we could just scroll down, the juxtaposition of the three images uh, 
is uh, is absolutely terrific and the uh, the diversity that one is seeing here is is really quite amazing it kind of sums up prokaryote versus eukaryote doesn't it as well yeah it's yeah complexity yep. So one, one very gentle criticism, it's usually referred to as the three kingdoms of life, not the three domains of life. Just we will edit that out. Oh, here we go. Yeah, that it, it, when it, it's classically described as the three kingdoms. I feel like I've deleted the word kingdoms in and out of this so many times. Yeah, so okay. That's probably my yeah. mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, the, the part of the challenge here is that domain has a very special meaning for us in the protein world. Mm -hmm. right. And I like to, <clears throat> I, I prefer to avoid using the same word in a, in a, in a piece of prose to mean two completely different things. Uh, because for the uninitiated, that can be quite, uh, that can be quite confusing. Uh, Shuchi? I, I think you guys did a great job. Uh, again, difference between yesterday and today is tremendous. And um, great job um so you cleaned up all the confusion between the various flavors that uh, we talked about yesterday so i think that was great so i heard you say when you were reading the figure legend i heard you say catalytic rna is shown in red but i think it only reads as rna because there are different okay. flavors of rna so if you wanted um, to you no, so all the RNA is the catalytic subunit, so it's all the same chain. So, but the T RNA is in yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so you think it would be more clear to? Because that's how you read it. So I think right. you were. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, I think reading should... it and saying it that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You, you, you could also it. say the RNA. The RNA is P RNA. Is yeah. Shown. That. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good clarification. It was just there was a discrepancy between what you were reading and what was in your head and what was oh, on the sorry. paper. No, no, yeah. this is great. Now, yeah. now we've addressed it. Now, and one other um, thought I had about your opening paragraph is um, you use the words enzyme and catalysis, um, but you don't actually say that a catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction or an enzyme speeds up a chemical reaction. And for the most uninitiated reader, that's a piece of information that they need. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be tricky to add. Okay. I know what you mean. David knows what you mean. Shuchi knows what you mean. But uh, somebody encountering this for the first time might not. And yeah. we, we really do want these um, Molecule of the Month articles to serve as a doorway, an open doorway to the PDB, not a closed door. I agree, and I think it's an important concept because you are actually challenging that um, only proteins are not catalysts. You have RNAs as catalysts, so you're, you're providing different flavors of this activity, so you should at least first be really clear about what is this activity. Yeah. Great. Very nice. So who is next? Uh, the scarlet red blood cells. Oh, terrific. <clears throat> Let me share my screen really quick. Okay, Candace, thank you. Okay. Can everybody see our article, see the pointer? Mm hmm. Could you just hold for one second? There's some vacuuming going on. I need to just shut the door. So Natalie asked in chat here whether to have the PDB IDs in lowercase or capitals. I think we usually do lowercase, right. but don't worry about that. We're going to be doing a detailed proof of these things at the last minute to catch little, little uh, style things like that. Yeah, I actually replied to her uh, directly. Um, so the, the 
rationale is that we want to be able to distinguish between the I, one, L, and that's why we use the lowercase. Yeah. And we'll have, we'll have explicit links as well so that people yeah. don't really ever have to type it in. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Never type in a PDB ID if you can avoid it. Always cut and paste. Okay, so we are just red blood cells. Um, our topic is hemoglobin, and um, Anna is going to go ahead and start us off with our teaser. Can you make that a little bit bigger, please? Better? Yep. Much better. Thanks. So our teaser is fetal hemoglobin, a key difference necessary for fetal survival. A growing fetus requires oxygen and other essential nutrients for life from its mother. Unless the fetus possesses a special mechanism to share this oxygen, it will not receive enough for proper development. Fortunately, the fetus has something on its side, fetal hemoglobin. Imagine a fetus surrounded by fluid with no direct access to the outside world. With a special molecule, fetal hemoglobin, a fetus can get the oxygen needed to develop and grow without leaving the womb. Essential efficient exchange. Fetal hemoglobin is the main oxygen carrying protein in the red blood cells of human fetuses that allow for the efficient exchange of oxygen from the mother to the fetus. But how is one hemoglobin able to pass its oxygen to a different hemoglobin? It can achieve this feat because fetal hemoglobin possesses a higher oxygen affinity than adult hemoglobin A under normal healthy conditions. This unique property allows the fetus to gain the necessary amount of oxygen for survival despite the placental barrier and complete separation of maternal and fetal bloodstreams. Fetal hemoglobin most commonly predominates during the last two trimesters of gestation. By the end of the first year of life, adult hemoglobin is abundant and fetal hemoglobin is nearly absent. Two subunits make one big difference. During pregnancy, the maternal adult hemoglobin is separated from the fetal hemoglobin by the placenta. The mother's hemoglobin gives up oxygen, which is taken up by the fetal hemoglobin. This process is possible due to the structural differences between the fetal and adult hemoglobin molecules. A hemoglobin molecule has four subunits. Both the fetal and adult hemoglobin have two identical alpha subunits. However, the adult hemoglobin molecule has two beta subunits, while the fetal hemoglobin molecule has two gamma subunits. At the time of birth, alpha genes remain fully active. In contrast, the genes that encode for the gamma chain are decreased, and the genes that encode for the beta chain are increased. Thanks to the gamma subunits, fetal hemoglobin has an increased affinity for oxygen in the presence of organic phosphates, which are abundant at the placenta. Organic phosphates such as 2,3-diphosphoglycerate or 2,3-DPG lower oxygen affinity in adult hemoglobin. This causes oxygen to be released for fetal hemoglobin to capture. Due to these key structural modifications, fetal hemoglobin binds less tightly to 2,3-DPG, allowing it to readily grab the oxygen. All these differences work together to pass oxygen from the mother to the fetus. And this is um, our first figure. It's a comparison of fetal hemoglobin, which is shown on the left, and adult hemoglobin, which is shown on the right. Um, alpha subunits are shown in pink, gamma subunits in orange, beta subunits in yellow, and hemes in red. A solution for sickle cell anemia. Fetal hemoglobin is not just a molecule necessary for the beginning of life, but in fact, it may pave the way for a future treatment of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a disease that is caused by a mutation on the beta subunit in adult hemoglobin that causes red blood cells to take an abnormal shape akin to a sickle. Treatments are currently available for this condition, but they require lifelong treatment. Due to the severity of this disease, it is imperative to find other methods that do not require ongoing treatment throughout and beyond childhood. Fetal hemoglobin lacks the beta subunit, which means it lacks the mutation. During your life, you retain a minimal amount of fetal hemoglobin. It may be possible for the amounts of fetal hemoglobin to be increased, similar to levels seen in individuals with the condition hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, otherwise known as HPFH. The symptoms of sickle cell anemia may be alleviated due to the increased prevalence of the unmutated or fetal hemoglobin. 
Increasing the amount of fetal hemoglobin in an adult could be accomplished by inducing mutation with gene therapy to stop a silencer named BCL11A from binding. A silencer is a protein that prevents a gene from being read or transcribed. It could also be accomplished by directly interrupting the binding between the silencer and the promoter region of the fetal hemoglobin gene. Either of these methods would make it possible to simulate HPFH in a patient, which could reduce the symptoms of sickle cell anemia. And then we have our second figure, which is a, I'll wait till we get down to the caption. Um, it's, in these images, you can see a segment of DNA from two different angles, pictured in orange and red, being bound by a, pro bound by a protein pictured in blue. This protein is a silencer named BCL11A, which binds to a segment of DNA in the region of the fetal hemoglobin gene that regulates transcription. Exploring the structure. Less 2,3 DPG for me, mom. <laughs> in these representations of hemoglobin A in adults on the left and fetal hemoglobin on the right, you can see how these proteins interact with 2,3 DPG. 2,3 DPG binds to and regulates the ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, 2,3 DPG fits snugly in the cavity between the beta chains and forms charge-based interactions with neighboring amino acids of the beta chains of hemoglobin A. This prevents binding of hemoglobin A to oxygen. In contrast, gamma chains of fetal hemoglobin contain several different amino acids in hemoglobin A, colored in mint green above, at critical locations which are necessary for interaction with 2,3-DPG. In addition, such amino acids Alterations increase the distance between key amino acids that are shared between the gamma and beta chains, colored in purple, so that they are too far away to bind to 2,3-DPG. These differences allow 2,3-DPG to bind and regulate adult hemoglobin A much stronger than fetal hemoglobin. With less 2,3-DPG bound, bound to it, fetal hemoglobin can bind oxygen more tightly. In the above image, fetal hemoglobin is shown without 2,3-DPG, which is uniquely colored uh, with oxygen and pink, just for clarity, as no structure of fetal hemoglobin has been determined with 2,3-DPG. We continue to investigate how 2,3-DPG interacts with and regulates adult versus fetal hemoglobin. Click on the image for an interactive experience. And our actual JMOL will have a first representation of the adult hemoglobin bound to the 2,3-DPG and the different interactions that you can see but represented by the um, bonds lengths in the um, stick cartoons. And then if you click on the button, it should transition, fade away, and bring up the um, fetal hemoglobin image, which lacks the 2,3-DPG um, uh, because of the structural, there's no structure right now that has the 2,3-DPG, but you'll still be able to see um, key amino acids um, that are similar between the adult and the fetal with the um, green amino acids being amino acids that have changed between the two and the purple being amino acids that have, are the same but not exactly in the same position. Really nice. And uh, topics for further discussion. Would you like to learn more about hemoglo how hemoglobin was discovered? Click here to read more. Giant earthworms used or earthworms used giant hemoglobin for oxygen transport. Click here to find out why. Cool. <laughs> and can, can we look at the JMOL real quick? Yeah. So I know you spent a lot of time <clears throat> uh, getting this very complex story. Uh, how to deal with it with colors, the colors and the representations. And you came up with a, a the, the colors are really engaging. Um, so, I mean, what, what fun. I think we'll probably add one more little label to this that says human and fetal up near the top, just to make that totally obvious to people and give them some hints. But I think your, your small labels work, work really well. Um, yeah, could we go up to the first paragraph? Okay. 
so i mean this look at what you what this whole what you guys have done this is amazing you went from uh a, a topic about the fetus competing with the mom to uh to, to it being a much more friendly thing but at the same time that one little phrase the fetus has something on its side is just a really perfectly deft um subtle way to bring that that idea of competition back into the uh, the article I, I really i applaud you that was a really nice decision um yeah beautiful uh and then i wanted to say something about the secondary topic Uh, oh, just that the, the first sentence of this as well um, just builds, it's a perfect transition sentence. It builds on everything you've been talking about before and takes it into this, um, uh, into this secondary topic and, and hope for the future. It, it really uh, nicely conceived there, the, the way you're transitioning between the two topics. Um, so do we have other, other comments about this one? I wanted to add a small comment to this this secondary topic. So, uh, your that first sentence, I I agree. I really like that sentence to transition from the the primary topic to this uh, sickle cell discussion. But uh, I'm wondering whether you want to be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, affirmative by saying that it is. Uh, playing a key role. So currently sickle cell is treated, if you're not going the gene therapy route, the traditional um, therapeutic uh, option is hydroxyurea. And hydroxyurea actually works by increasing the fetal hemoglobin production. And so instead of saying may pave the way, I think it is part of the treatment protocol is. So you may want to just consider that minor change in that tone. Because it sounds like, oh, in future, some you know, in some future date, it will happen. But this is how it is currently treated, and that's tricky though because it might not perfectly relate to the the molecule that they're showing. No, you don't have to bring in hydroxyurea. I, but the hydroxyurea's uh, function is to increase fetal hemoglobin production. So the treatment actually is uh, acting by the fetal hemoglobin. So the change that you just made is paving the way. Oh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I think I think that yeah. that's that's correct. The, but let's just be clear: hydroxyurea is a highly non-specific and toxic compound. Yes. And there actually is a, um, a U.S. FDA-approved oral drug uh, that binds directly to hemoglobin to the hemoglobin yes. S, and oh, this is called Oxbrita. Um, it was it was discovered by actually by a company that was founded by one of the members of the RCSB PDB, Andre Sali, mm -hmm. uh, and it's um, you know, but uh, even though the side effect profile of um, Oxbrita is superior to that of uh, of hydroxyurea, you still don't want a pediatric population being committed to take a, dr a drug every day for the rest of their lives, starting at the age of six months when sickle cell disease would become apparent. True, and, but yeah. I was so, just so talking that's, so about that's the, the current... that's, So that's the argument um, yeah. for, um, uh, for the, um, the gene therapy type approach, uh, or, or in this case, the CRISPR uh, type approach where you're changing the sequence of a protein to induce a, a phenomenon that's 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 seen in nature in this uh, HPFH, and um, that was the other comment that I was going to uh, uh, ask, and maybe it was discussed in the group. Uh, the fact that uh, it is not FDA approved, but it is in clinical trials. The this gene therapy approach of BC eleven A, BCL eleven A. Yeah. And is that why you didn't put it in because it is not yet approved? Or any hint or any mention of gene therapy was not here? I think we were um, concerned that perhaps there wasn't any verifiable um, source indicating that it is currently being used. 
like I said, it's in cl clinical trials. It is not yeah, you approved. Could, yeah. yeah, you. I mean, it's you could find evidence, affirmative evidence for the clinical trial in the in the, at the website clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah. Which is a listing of every clinical trial that's underway in the United States and many that are underway in different parts of the of the world. Yeah. Not not comprehensive outside the U.S., but absolutely comprehensive and reliable uh, inside the U.S. Yeah, but and we hope that, that it works. Yeah, we hope that it works. But um, uh, because if you think about the lifelong cost of um, uh, treating somebody with sickle cell disease, the cost of intervening through a gene therapy approach actually becomes quite attractive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Change the and sentence here. This um, is being tested. Well, I, what I would suggest you do is just put in parentheses after this um, uh, after this sentence, a clinical trial to uh, to test this hypothesis is currently underway. And I think both the CRISPR way and the adenoviral vector way, both are being tried. Right. And uh, Samuel, I'll just put in a little comment here mentioning that you might want to just put a nod into some of the symptoms of sickle cell anemia. And that could just be one half little phrase right after that symptoms of sickle cell anemia sentence to see if that uh, uh, expands your story a little bit. Okay. Great. Yeah, pain, yeah, painful crises. Uh, you have pain crises, yeah. Uh, damage, uh, damage to uh, organs like the kidney. Spleen, it's, kidney. Yeah, but, but you know, as I've told Shuchi from, from my clinical experience, the worst thing that happens to individuals with sickle cell disease is that they become uh, drug addicts. Yeah. They become addicts to, uh, to narcotics. Right. And um, so they spend a lot of time ensuring that they are cron constantly Chronic being medicated. Management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would it's they very, agree there? very, very tough. Yeah. That this, might take the topic away to a completely yeah. different direction. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. But yeah. it is. I mean, the the, re, the reality of being a young adult with sickle cell disease is not so different from the reality of being a heroin addict. So, so can they just say such as pain and organ damage? Yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> Great. And then uh, in that last uh, last sentence. Um, the very last sentence of the paragraph, uh, you've got symptoms of sickle cell anemia again. Um, the, uh, you might want to have a different close, a more encouraging closing here that, uh, um, you know, could, it, could eliminate um, uh, sickling, uh, you know, something to that effect. Sickling of red blood cells, returning to your roots as the, uh, the Scarlet uh, RBC. Super. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the last uh, topic, the super sequencers. So the nanopore, very good. Yeah. Our nanotech. Yeah. So I can share my screen. Okay, Catherine, do you want to start? Yeah, um, if you can go down to the tray, I mean the teaser. Um, so our teaser is um, designer nanopores work with enzymes to offer pocket-friendly, pocket-sized DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing has revolutionized the study of life sciences. The Human Genome Project took a total of 13 years and cost almost $3 billion using the conventional Sanger chain termination method. The need for faster, better, and more cost-effective sequencing techniques became clear as the enthusiasm for genomics grew. Um, nanopore sequencing is a rapidly developing tool to meet these demands, with devices often, often costing less than $1,000. This technology is used everywhere, from Antarctica to the International Space Station. So the next paragraph, we talk about how they're pocket-sized sequencers. Nanopore sequencing decodes DNA as the molecule is drawn through a tiny pore embedded in a membrane. Changes in electrical current across the pore are measured to identify DNA bases. Compared to conventional DNA sequencing approaches, nanopore sequencing directly 
detects nucleotides without relying on DNA synthesis or amplification. This technique also enables sequencing of long reads, long fragments of DNA, which can be used to piece together entire genomes of organisms quickly and reliably. A single device houses thousands of individual nanopores, and yet is simple, inexpensive, and can even fit in your pocket. Scientists are currently tackling challenges such as reducing error rates and increasing yields per run. Nanopores in action. A nanopore sequencer is composed of nanopores embedded in a membrane, which splits the salt solution in two chambers. A voltage applied across the membrane causes ionic flow, which can be measured. When a DNA molecule is pulled through the pore, the ion flow is blocked, leading to a reduction in the observed current. Each nucleic acid base is associated with a different level of ion current change, which enables its identification. Commercially available sequencers currently use the bacterial protein CSGG as the go-to nanopore. CSGG is an ungated, non-selective, outer membrane protein with a pore diameter of around one nanometer, which allows for the easy passage of single-stranded DNA. Engineering of CSGG has reshaped the nanopore as described below, resulting in greater yields and more accurate sequencing reads. Um, our next topic is regulating DNA threading. Precise control of the DNA strand is required for maintaining efficient sequencing rates as it passes through the nanopore. Negatively, Negatively charged DNA passes through pores too fast to get a clear read of each base. Adding an enzyme motor to the nanopore machinery can help to regulate DNA speed. Scientists have found proteins such as helicases or polymerases to be up to the task. The bacteriophage 529 DNA polymerase is shown here. Um, this enzyme acts as an anchor to slow down the DNA. In association with, with 529 DNA polymerase, CSGG can ratchet DNA through its pore at a single nucleotide resolution. Nature's pores. Uh, sorry, for some reason the editing is a little messed up here, but... Okay, yeah. Other pore-forming membranes, membrane proteins are abundant in nature. Alpha hemolysin, a bacterial toxin, was the first biological nanopore used for sequencing. It features a fluctuating channel diameter size, approximately 1.5 nanometers to 2.5 nanometers, making it suboptimal for detecting individual nucleic acid bases. The mycobacterial protein MSPA is another naturally occurring nanopore that differs in its sensing region length. With shorter sensing regions, less nucleotides influence the characteristics of the recorded current, resulting in a more accurate sequence reading. Since MSPA exhibits a channel diameter of 1.2 nanometers and a shorter sensing region, it is a better sequencer compared to alpha hemolysin. So dual constricted nanopores in action. Scientists have engineered genetically modified nanopores with greater pore stability and tuned for optimal function. For example, dual constriction nanopores combine a second biological protein to introduce another constriction for detecting DNA. The CSGG-CSGF complex shown here highlights the CSGG molecule in blue and the CSGF molecule in pink. The initial constriction point for DNA is shown in yellow. The attached accessory protein CSGF adds a sec second constriction, which contributes to improved signal output and base reading accuracy. So for our JMOL, um, we're going to show the protein complex in two different re representations. For the ribbon, we have a side view button and a top view button. And then uh, we wanted to show surface representation to clearly depict um, the two constriction points. And for topics for further discussion, uh, we mentioned that there are two other um, nanopore proteins. Uh, the first one is the 529 connector protein. It's the first nanopore that's neither a membrane protein nor an ion channel, and it's capable of double-stranded DNA translocation. Uh, aerolysine uh, is another commonly used sensor borrowed from a gram-negative bacterium. And then for the third point, we encourage them to read about synthetic or solid-state nanopores. Nice, really, really nice. So I, I should just mention to the whole group that this team faced a really severe challenge with this article in that most of the literature 
for it comes from companies that are making these nanopores uh, or sequencers, and they don't want to give up any of their secrets. So it was a constant process of trying to find enough information to support this. And you've done a beautiful job with, uh, with decoding these papers and coming up with a nice, clear, coherent story of how these work. Uh, in particular, the, um, uh, the second section, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, la the last paragraph of the first section, nanopores in action. This first paragraph is just really clear saying all the bits and pieces you need to make this the sequencing work. And then going down to the regulating DNA threading one. Uh, no, no, the, the nature's pores one. Uh, there's a, a place down here where you, in one sentence you say with shorter sensing regions, nucleotides are red and so it's more accurate which is a really nice, concise um, structure function story. You know, here's the picture that shows that the reading region is bigger. And the, the consequence of that is that the, the narrower one reads the bases better. So that's just the kind of story we always want to tell. So it's a really nice, nice way of, of navigating this awful literature. <laughs> so we have other comments? I thought this was really nicely done. I agree with you, David, and um, I learned something. So thank you. Yeah, and I, 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 I'm sorry, I had the mute on. I agree. I, uh, I too learned a lot from this. And uh, I, I really I was aware of these pores and the fact that they were these handheld DNA sequences. And, but uh, I had, uh, I had no idea how they worked and, and there was such a diversity of, uh, of different pores being used to um, uh, optimize the, uh, you know, the performance of, of these, uh, these sequencing devices. Uh, just could we just go back up to the first paragraph? Um, uh, yes. Uh, The, the device, hey, Steve, I don't know how much these devices cost this and get any, a person's, the entire genome sequence for an individual $1,000 as a lab test. Stephen, could you say that again? You're kind of breaking Did, up a bit. Was that, was that clear, David? Uh, the, you were breaking up a bit, so we didn't get your, your comment. Yeah, okay, so let me, let me repeat. I don't know how much these devices cost. The goal in modern DNA sequencing is to be able to sequence the entire genome of a person for less than a thousand bucks. That's where this, that's where I trotted out this thousand dollar number. Um, and uh, so you might want to rephrase that sentence ever so slightly. Okay. And I love the technology is used everywhere from Antarctica to the International Space Station. Isn't that wonderful? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, we, uh, we in, um, are very proud of the fact that structures have come into the protein data bank from every inhabited continent in, in, on the globe. But that, of course, excludes Antarctica. And uh, no structures have come from the International Space Station. But there are structures, so Stephen. The crystals were grown in the space station. Oh, yes, yeah. But they had to be brought back to Earth yeah. for the structures to be determined. And yeah, we're not there's no evidence. It. There's no evidence that crystallization in space has uh, any benefit broadly on the field of structural biology. Yep. It was NASA trying to justify its existence um, that drove some of that. Right. Great. Okay, well, I mean, everybody, all of the participants, all six teams, you should all be really proud of, of what you put together. I think we're going to be able to, to put these up on the site with very little editing from here. So, yeah. um, and, and I'm quite confident given the, um, the intensity of uh, your literature reviews that when they do get uh, reviewed by, uh, peer reviewed by the experts, 
uh, I don't think they're going to come back with uh, with any any questions about accuracy. I agree. Yeah. Um, so I think I'd like to go since we're a little bit ahead of schedule. I'd like to go a little off script script and do just a little presentation of what's going to happen next. Okay, and then we'll take a break and do the closing ceremonies and stuff. Thank you, so David. Let me let me share my screen here. And I'm just going to give you a little look here behind the scenes. Okay, so these are some of the pages that we use at the RCSB uh, to plan Molecule of the Month articles and then to, um, to put them up on the web. So this is just a page that we use to help plan what we're going to do in the future. So um, we can see all the 2020 articles here. Uh, these are the two that we just did for January and February this month or this year. And so we'll be dotting in your six articles, probably starting either March or April. Uh, and we'll be doing those in an order that fits uh, the different goals of the um, of PDB 101, like supporting our future uh, cancer uh, um, uh, cancer yearly theme and stuff like that. We'll also probably try to mix them up so that we don't do all the big things first and small things last, and mix up the DNA uh, and RNA uh, related ones, stuff like that, just so we get some variety. So that's what that site looks like. We have down below here, we have a whole list of suggestions from people of, of things to do in the future. Uh, and so we, we pulled your six topics from that big growing and ever changing list of things that are still left to do. Okay, uh, this is a page that we have on the site telling me what it is I need to do for each article, okay? So this is the process of what happens uh, first, I typically write the column uh, and then I post it in our content management sy uh, system and we send it out for external review. And so that can take anywhere from a day to a month, depending how, on how fast the expert is in getting back to us. Uh, I typically try to find the scientist who was the major author on the major structure shown in the paper. So that is usually a person that's kind of invested in having articles about their work, right, published. So they, they generally get back pretty fast and are excited to have an article about their work featured on the site. Uh, once that review comes back, I revise the, the whole article based on comments that they make. Uh, some reviewers just write back and say, gee, this is great, thanks. And some have a whole bunch of detailed comments that and generally, it, the reviewers that have detailed comics, comments, they're trying to add a lot more jargon back to the articles. So um, I usually need to, to push back a little bit on them and say, you know, this isn't a journal article, it's not a full review, so we can do some of this. Is there anything factually wrong that we have to change? So there, there's always some negotiation at that point. Uh, so then after, after that review is done and uh, the manuscript is revised, then we do an internal review. That's typ typically Stephen is the one that does the internal review just to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, uh, so that's uh, uh, just for readability and making sure everything is spot on. Uh, so then I update the column and then release it for publication on the site. We send it off to um, a person at, at PDBJ to uh, translate into Japanese. Uh, and then there's a bunch of stuff that happens at the RCSB uh, to make sure that it comes out in the right place at the right day and linked to all of the other resources at PDB1 that it needs to be linked to. And then finally, uh, Christine, our director of, uh, of outreach, uh, she does a, some nice social media posts uh, and she has a newsletter that she sends out every month that describes the molecule of the month and other stuff related to it. So again, I'll remind you if you want um, your social media, if you want to be tagged when we do that, uh, be sure in your manuscript to drop your, uh, put your Twitter handles and everything in that. <clears throat> 
and we'll also uh, we'll also send you emails uh, when it's going to be up on the site, just so you'll know when to go and look and show it off to friends and family. Okay, and then finally, I'll just give you a little preview of here of what my life is going to be like for the next six months. Uh, each month is we have this uh, really nice content management uh, system that allows us to uh, create uh, and update uh, all of the materials on PDB 101. So there's a whole section over here for the molecule of the month uh, that has uh, up to uh, 254 of them now. Here's the new one that's going to come up in uh, February on uh, cellulose synthase. Uh, and you can see it's been reviewed, but it hasn't made public yet. And uh, it just has all the sections that, that you've written with your teams, categories, keywords, your teasers. Uh, I'll drop your images in here. Uh, these are all the sections of text down here in headers. Second section here, here's the JMAL. Uh, where is this text? Oh no, the JMAL is down here. Uh, and here's that big script that you wrote. Some of you have scripts that are much longer than this one that I've written. Uh, so we'll put that in there. And then I'll go back and forth about 20 times uh, to make sure that every little uh, semicolon is in the right place in this script to make it work. Um, and finally, it'll go, it'll go live on the site. So that's a little preview. Uh, any questions from, from uh, any of the participants here about uh, the, the the process, these next steps. I think all I need from everybody is that final manuscript and the JMAL script.